Thank you very much. I'm going to stand up and uh, speak mostly because I'm so small that I was sit down. <laughs> you are a giant. See, <laughs> and, and I start to talk like this here. And again, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, for your patience. I actually started out. You'd think that you'd think that I was actually coming from the other side of the earth, but I started out from home at half past one today. But once I got into the airport, easy jet should be really a difficult jet because we just couldn't. We were sitting on the runway for 10 minutes and that then became half an hour and then that became an hour. But you were already too far out to say, could I get off this plane? I could maybe get a bus, except the camp. Uh, so I, I just had to to sit there and, and, and hang in. But in fact, the gods were with me when I got off the plane because I managed quite quickly to get over to the southern terminal. We have to fly into Gatwick now. Uh, we're not good enough to fly into Heathrow or something. We fly, <laughs> fly into Gatwick, but I managed to get here, and, and thank you very much. But it did give me some time to think of of what I wanted to say. Certainly, in in such a bust company uh, of historians and scholars and activists, and I think the thing that has to be said is that quite often when people do things that inspire others, they themselves are not aware at the point of doing it that they are an inspiration. They're only actually trying to get themselves out of the hole that they're in. And they may not realize until they become involved in that, or even later, how that is related to other things. And, and of course, at this point in, in the hundreds uh, commemoration of the Rising, this is actually the week in which each of the leaders of the Rising were, were executed. And, and yesterday at, at dawn was when James Connolly, who was the, the greatest internationalist yes. of the Rising, uh, was shot. And, and Connolly at the time of his execution was actually dying. Connolly would not have recovered from his injuries and, and they had to strap him into a chair to maintain any level of upright position to allow him to be shot and that was in 1916. Now if somebody outside any, any state, any government outside the United Kingdom in the 21st century was to do that there would be calls for cases of war crimes to be brought to the head. To take a dying man and, and artificially prop him up so that you could kill him would be would be in any in any book a war a war crime. But we are, are well used to the fact that a, a war crime is what somebody else does. War crime is always what somebody else does. war crime in terms of British war crimes can't really exist, exist because, because the British government for generations and that went to Labour, Liberal and Conservative governments, the British imperial mentality in the British government has a great sophistication is that it legalises its actions first. And then they say, well, it couldn't be a war crime because we have a law here that says, you know, if you do this, this is what the punishment is. And the people keep on doing it. So when you when you come to, to the 1916 Rising, it's maybe important to see it from the perspective of the Irish themselves. They didn't talk to, they weren't totally aware, that is to say all of the people in the Rising, and then all of the people in Ireland inspired by the Rising to go forward and, and strike out in the War of Independence. That's not to say, as I say, that Connolly didn't understand internationalism. And that's not to say that at that time, internationalism and the international left did not understand the rising. Because, because Marx and Engels themselves berated the English left 
at the beginning of the 20th century for their inability to understand the position in Ireland, for their, for their inability to support the Irish. But if you go back to, to Ireland itself at that time, before the 1916 war, uh, it's important you know, for others to understand the context. And when you see it, you see the great similarities uh, with other colonial, with other colonial uh, oppressed nations. The movement for independence and the movement for freedom and against oppression in Ireland started the day the oppression started. It started in, you know, it started with some people, the very day oppression started, the very first time that, that the English came. Uh, and, and if you look through a lot of our old folk music, uh, and drove us to the fern, is, is, is a phrase that's used in the rural areas. They drove us off our lands, and I don't know if city people know what the fern is, but it's that sort of green swathe of stuff that grows on land that nothing else grows on. And so the English, as we say, drove us to the fern. They drove us into the bogs, they drove us into the barren land, they drove us to the top of the mountains. And they colonized that land, uh, ultimately, with their, they paid their, their soldiers with land in Ireland, and they colonized that land with tenant farmers from the lowlands of Scotland and from Northern England predominantly. So they created that population. The way they created that colonizing population was different maybe in other countries, but the methodology was the same. They created, first of all, uh, a grouping of loyal citizens, whoever they were, and whatever country they were in. But in, in, in Northern Ireland, they bought, they, they bought the aristocracy, they intimidated the poor, and they planted is the word that we use, not these are just colloquial words. Plant like planting crops. They planted the, the area with people. So they brought over people who took the land. And it's interesting because I live and was born and reared in the country, that those things happened in the in sixteen in the sixteen hundreds. But the population dispersal in Ireland to this day in the rural areas is the map, if you look from the, from the Irish nationalist population and the British nationalist population, which is the right way to describe the people, the British nationalist population in Ireland, if you look at the map where those populations are located, still in a very segregated <coughs> fashion, that map is closer to the 1600s plantation than anything else, except that they kept growing out and we kept get pushing back of the land. So the farmers got bigger and our land got smaller. And very few people tell you that in terms of the broader history of Ireland, because most of the revolutionary stories are told about the cities and the workers and everything else. But to this day, passed down, and very much like the Palestinians, to this day, Everybody knows, and I see, a, I see an old head of like my own nodding. We all know who owned that small field when it was taken off them 400 years ago. We all know who owned it, to what family it belonged. And for most people, their families still live not 15, not 20, not 30 miles away from that piece of land. And that piece of land has been aggrandized into big farms that are now not even owned by the people who are planted on them. Owned by big farmers, owned by companies keeping chickens in sheds miles long. But notwithstanding that, we still know the ground on which our four fathers and four mothers stood and were driven off. And that still matters to us. And that's not to say that we think that other people shouldn't be there. But they shouldn't be there as a position of privilege over us. They shouldn't be there in, in that way. And when we go back to the beginning of the, of, the, of the century, that was the nature, the whole of Ireland was governed by Britain. And that was the nature of the whole of Ireland. And a number of things that happened 
was that there was a, a, a movement, a new movement, which came out of, of the land league, around the land. It came out of the new socialist revolutionary movement of the rights of workers. But the realisation that people needed to be able to determine their own future if they were to build a society in which people could live. So the, the concept of self-determination and home rule became the, the, the big unifying feature of all the groups in Ireland. And before 1914, the, the right-wing right pro-British nationalists who were the big mill owners and using, using the, the Protestant religion to divide and using religion as it has been used everywhere to divide ordinary people. The, the interest of the, the big mill owners was that there should be no home rule because they actually suppressed trade in Ireland to support their trade in England. Nonetheless, the popular movement continued to grow and the right wing armed, illegally armed, they brought weapons in from Canada. The British Army gave them weapons and they formed an unlawful armed organisation called the Ulster Volunteer Force. And that Ulster Volunteer Force was uh, an illegal right-wing secret military organisation. And members of it were members of the police and members of the army. And as a result of that, then the home people in the Home Rule movement began to arm as well and they created the Irish Volunteers. So you had that beginning of aligning armed struggle and armed organisations with the independence movement on the one hand. And on the other hand, you had an increasingly impoverished population. You had the 1913 lockout uh, in which Mr Murphy, uh, who was a good Irish nationalist Catholic, locked his workers out and starved them into submission. And James Larkin and Connolly and the other great trade union leaders were organising the working class and the labour and the labour movement. And then the Great War came along. And England tried to recruit. I mean, some people have no Shia, that's all I can say. <laughs> some people have absolutely no Shia. But the British Army then tried to recruit all of these people to go and die fighting an imperialist war in Europe. And it was interesting that the Ulster Volunteer Force was allowed to join what the British called the Old Pals Regiments, which is what existed in England. But in England, these were people who came out of the same village, people who came out of the same factory. In Northern Ireland, or in Ireland at the time, there was no Northern Ireland, in Ireland at the time, this Pals Regiment was a right-wing murder gang of illegal armed persons against the democratic wishes of the country. So they formed a Pals Regiment. And then the move was on to get the nationalists to join the war in Europe as well. And John Redmond and some of the Home Rule leaders, they agreed with the British, I mean, on the broken promises of 700 years. <laughs> and to this very day, there are people in Ireland who are just such decent, decent people really. They're just so, such kind and decent and gullible and naive people that when the British government makes them another promise, they forget all the broken ones and they say, well, that, that sounds all right, and they fall for it again. So Redmond, at that time, he started to recruit from the nationalist movement for the army to go and fight in Europe. And it was James Connolly who raised the slogan, we will serve neither king nor king. <laughs> and uh, the promise was made to Redmond that Home Rule, which had been supported and passed through the British Parliament, would be granted to Ireland 
at the end of the 1914 war. It was perfectly clear none of that was going to happen. And as I say, the, the Irish Republican Brotherhood came together, that tradition of armed struggle, and James Connolly and the Labour uh, Socialist and Republican movement came together, and, and they created a plan for the rising. And there's much talk in Ireland, it would break your heart, it would break your heart to be in Ireland and watch the excuse for a government. And you can see how, how would the government of, of the Republic of Ireland, how could the government commemorate the rising? Because there is no continuity between the rising and the present government. None. None Yes. There are countries where you could look and say, you know, they come out of that history, but they have disgraced it. These people have disgraced it, but they didn't come out. Yes. The government, the, the, the history it followed us was, people now try to tell us the rising was a mistake. Yes. If they had just sat quietly at the end of the war, the British would have kept a promise. You have to ask the Palestinians, do you think that was right? I said, you think that was right? In 1916, the Arab Rebellion, the British promised them the same thing. Same thing. The same thing. Where is it? What did you countries in this is the war we have? So after, uh, after the, the rising itself, and there are some good stories about the rising and the things that are interesting, is that in the north, the, the people of the North were so, because, because partition was introduced, were so betrayed over that period of time by the partitioning of the country, were so isolated that many people just closed their eyes and closed their mouth and never opened it again until the 1960s came along. And one of the things that I only discovered in the 100th anniversary of the Rising. And you, when I tell you it, you will say that couldn't be true. But I was going through uh, some of the historic archives that people have now found, and somebody was telling me, we're talking about a woman whom I didn't know, an elderly lady I knew, and that she was in common a man in the Women's Revolutionary Army. But in the testimony that she had provided before she died, she had listed some of the other people you know, who were in her common, which is her, her unit or group. And there was my grandmother, who was a member of Common Man. You would think I would know that. <laughs> In her life, she would have told somebody. Now, my grandmother died in 1967, before the, the civil rights movement and everything started. But I have to say, in all the years I knew this woman, I knew her very well. I knew her as my grandmother. And I spoke to the remaining children, uh, you know, my aunts and uncles, and she never, ever breathed that she had been a part. So how crushed and defeated were people, how betrayed were people, how lost were they, that they just drew a line under that. Uh, and, and I can see some of that happening in Ireland today. But following, following the execution, uh, we came to the end of the 1418 the war. And then we had, and this again, is, we see this in other places, the Irish exercised their self-determination by democratic vote. And people in England forget that. That in the 1918 general election, Sinn Féin at that point, uh, Sinn Féin, and it was because they were, they were the largest popular organization. Sinn Féin, a number of the smaller organizations stood as well, and quite often their vote doesn't get counted in the equation. Sinn Féin was a major party. But they all stood on, a, on a, a manifesto that if they had a democratic majority in the island, 
they would form a, a parliament, they would form a government, <laughs> and they would negotiate with the British government for the implementation of home rule which had been promised. And uh, just like we know where our lands are, we also know 86.13% of the electorate voted for independence. 86.13% voted for independence. And that's a bigger mandate than anybody is governing any part of this island at this time. And so they did form their parliament and within a week, once again, the British sent the gunboats up the Liffey and blew the parliament to bits and the War of Independence was started. If you go back in history, however, the plotting of the partitioning of Ireland was older than the War of Independence. Once we had, in, in 1907, 1908, secured tenant rights where people could in fact uh, begin to own their small holdings. There were people in the national camp, the nationalist organizations, who began to think that here was an opportunity for them to seize the small holdings of their neighbors and become big people and players in, 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 a, British, in a British colonial state. And here, here were people who were beginning to see that in order to make that happen, this would not, it would not, they would have to make their bed with the tenant farmers who were, who were from the plantation. And since they were not willing to buy into home rule, those who wanted to become big landowners already began to sell out independence for land. Not land for the people, but land for themselves. And, and so it was in the 1907-1908 Tenants Act that we began to see the beginning of the buy-in law. But one very wise and not, not very revolutionary member of parliament, who was a liberal unionist at the time, said, promise, give the unionists of Ireland anything but partition. As he said, make any concession you have to, but do not concede partition. And he also said, give anything you have to by way of concession to the Catholic Church, but do not give them education. <laughs> and we ended up with a settlement in which the Unionists got partition and the Catholic Church got education. So in the north we ended up with segregated education and in the south what actually happened was Connolly's worst nightmare came true. But it was post that period where people began to see uh, how, how the Irish Revolution tied in with other revolutions. It would be great to say that in Ireland in 1916, 1917, 18, the War of Independence, uh, that people were imbued with a sense of international socialism. They weren't. Or even internationalism, or even anti-colonialism in a global sense. In the, pop popular, in, in, in the popular mind, they weren't. And some other things began to happen. The Irish had to emigrate. And the hist I think the history of the Irish, if people studied the history of the Irish, they could understand the history of humanity very well. Because at the first wave of emigration, when we emigrated mostly to the United States, we were not an English-speaking people. People have forgotten that. When we first went to America, we were not an English-speaking people. And in fact, many of the words, which is quite interesting, the word jazz, and people say it was originally called chas, to spell J with a hard S, is the Irish, chas is the Irish word for eat. And, and jazz, jazz is a mixture of the music of Afro-Americans and the music of Irish-speaking Irish people who fell for it and, and tried to 
try to find words for it. And you go through a whole series of American English words that come out of a layer of period when actually those words were incorporated into American English by swathes of Irish-speaking immigrants. And at that period, you see that the Irish intermarry and mix. The Irish intermarry and mix, they are an immigrant population. They intermarry and mix with the black population, the Chinese population, the German population, uh, and, and that's their history at that time. And they're part of the radical immigration movement, and they're part of the immigration labor movement, and they're part of the formal of the trade union movement. But there's a specific point in the history of Irish America where the Irish chose to be white. The word, you know, and they did, and, and, and we have to be held accountable for that. The Irish chose to be white. Now, you say no, you, nobody chooses their colour. We are the colour we are. But in terms of the power brokerage, what I mean is they recognise that they, as other waves of immigrants came and the language had been beaten out of them, that the next wave of Irish immigrants were English speaking. And so they now were the same colour as the power base and they spoke the same language international solidarity of belonging to an international immigrant movement of the poor and an immigrant movement of the oppressed and an immigrant movement who came from countries that had been oppressed by imperialism to moving the narrative of their history into the white immigrant into the pilgrims uh, into the power base of America and for Irish people at home, that contradiction then sharpened for us, and certainly sharpened for my generation, the contradiction of why, why are we saying that over there when we know this over here? So it made a great difference in terms of our understanding of our own national identity of the people that we were. Uh, because when we went out to America to seek help, there were two kinds of people who went. And when I went, from my own perspective, the people who I saw belonged with me and to me were not white. That's just the way America is, I don't know if you've ever been there. But you can see it, and you can see it now when you see Donald Trump that the biggest division of poverty and the biggest division of inequality and the biggest division of poor health, it doesn't matter where it is and what you look at it, it is a division of colour. People of colour are poorer, more oppressed, they fill the jails, they, they, have, they, they are the homeless. And when you go there, you see it. You see the native population, you see the Native Indian, uh, Native American population, you see the, the Chicano, population, you see the Puerto Rican population, and then the minority population which is white and, and comes from Western Europe and Northern Europe. So you get a view of politics and that's how we then learned. But when we're fighting our own battle then, and we saw solidarity from people all over the world. Whenever I went to America first, the people who, who understood what we were saying, instantly was the black population who were reading Malcolm X, was the black population around the Black Panthers, was, was the, the Arab League, uh, was the Pal Palestinian Solidarity Movement, was the Chicano Movement, was the, the uh, Cesar Chavez's, uh, there's a word for them, they were a great workers union, but they were they were the people who crossed the border for camping work, migrant workers, and then were deported every year at the end of the season. So it was that that reawakened our thinking as to say, well, how do all these people know about us? How are all these people better informed about our history than we are? And then we go back and again see it is because that the history of struggle in Ireland has inspired the history of struggle there. And we began to see the same kind of things, that the, the movement for partition, the solution of partition, was a British solution all over the world. That's how we got India, Pakistan. Everywhere, you know, 
everywhere there is a problem. They just draw a line in the map and say, right, there's a line in the map, and you can fight across that line, and we'll get off scot free. It's a very simple solution, and they've been getting away with it for about for hundreds and hundreds of years. Great. Because they break things into pieces. That's the kind of peacemakers they are. So if, if we come forward to today to say then what is the legacy of the writer? Because that's the important thing. The important thing is not to sit and commemorate and, and be nostalgic, but say then what is the legacy of the rising and what are the lessons of the rising for today? And this meeting is the legacy of the rising. This is the best meeting. I've been at bigger meetings, I've been at rowdier meetings, <laughs> I've been at meetings where we argued with each other over what the legacy is. That might still come, that might still come. <laughs> but it is in this, it's in this dynamic, it's this dynamic of people coming from every struggle to discuss the importance of this that makes this probably the most important meeting of all the commemoration meetings of, of the rising. Because it is here that we can each draw lessons from our own struggles and understand them better. But it is also from understanding them that we build solidarity amongst each other and that we recognize in the same way as, as we would say in the labor or trade union movement, an injury to one is an injury to all. simply mean you know in the trade union terms it means that if you strike against uh, Palestine you strike against me you strike against Ireland if, if you strike against uh, people fighting racism you you fight against me and we have to begin to build that in very concrete terms because I tell you what I see happening now, I have to stop a minute. You said I wish you'd stop for good. I have to stop a minute and say. <laughs> uh, we had a great, we had a great victory. We had, we had, the, uh, as we say, we had an elections to the let on party, but we had a great victory in the assembly. And I tell you this, I, I, you know, I, sometimes I think we're going nowhere, and then I say, well. <laughs> Did we just do that? McCann was, was our man. And Jerry Carroll was our man. And we had a young woman who made a very brave start on very barren ground in North Belfast. But we raised the red flag in storm. And it hasn't been raised. And we sung the internationally at the election when we, had, when we elected the camp. And my son Connolly was there at, at the victory rallies. And people said to us, you're not, you're not green, you're not orange, but you're red. He said, now you got it. <laughs> they were trying to insult us. They were trying to insult us. You know, saying, you, see you, you're all red. He said, we've been trying to tell you that for 40 years. This is the way this international socialist solidarity path is the way to go down. This is a humanitarian path to follow. And, and we, we, made that, we made that breakthrough. But we have to keep trying to make it, because while that's a breakthrough for us, I can see what's happening here. And what's happening in, in, in England today, what's happening in the United Kingdom today, is a rerun of Ireland in which the victim is the Muslim community. It's as clear as a known gender here. You know, 1968, 1970, the we were referred to as a terrorist community. You just belong to it. That's what we were. By virtue of living in, by virtue of living in Ireland, supporting justice in Ireland, you are a member of a terrorist community. And now, people, quite people, people who should know better, now say that of the whole Muslim community. You can't really. that because we are a terrorist community, 
if somebody undertakes an action in the community that breaks the law, that is a criminal action, that is a terrorist action, it doesn't matter which of us go to jail. It doesn't matter because we're all the same thing. No matter who did it. Joint enterprise for that. Yeah. No who did it. Birmingham Six did it. Anybody. Yeah, Birmingham Six did it. The, you know, somebody did it. They don't care who they put in jail because we all look the same to them. But the worst thing that happens then is that when people try to stand up and say this is wrong, they're not saying that terrorism is right, but they're saying that accusing a whole community of being a terrorist community is wrong, of saying that just because an incident happens which somebody did, that it doesn't matter who in that community goes to jail is wrong. But once you say that, then you've got a name too. You're an apologist for terrorism. And sooner or later, and we see it now, we had in Northern Ireland what we call the conveyor belt to prison. And that's just what it was, it was a conveyor belt to prison. You were young, you were poor, you were nationalist, Catholic, Republican, you were mouthy, we were all mouthy, you had too much to say, or as we used to say, you swaggered past the police station, and that was enough, that was enough. And there were people who did 20 years in prison for swaggering past the police station. And there are young Muslims here in this country who will do 20 years for swaggering past police stations. And we cannot stand and say, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, this is different. This is different. We can't, say, we can't stand back and say this is different. Ireland was different. It's not different. It's the same when we see what, it, what is going on in Gaza, what's going on in the West Bank. It's not different. It's the same place. And it's the place of colonialism, of imperialism, and in behind it. Because that that is what drives it, whether you find it out tonight or whether you find it out next year or the year after. What fuels that cruel mentality which thinks that some people are there to be used and abused and made lesser human beings of by others by virtue of their historical demand for power or superiority. What fuels that is a system that believes that nobody exists in the world except either to buy and sell commodities or to be a commodity to be bought or sold. Yeah. And that's what capitalism is about. Capitalism brought us slavery, it brought us indented servitude, it brought us low wage labour. It bought us the, the <coughs> tying of women to the kitchen. Yeah. It divided us one against the other. And until, I mean, we start at this end of the string, but until we finally break the hold of capitalism on the whole world, and you won't do it tomorrow because it's very strong, but it's weakening. It is coming to points of its own contradiction. Immigration is a big point of it. Immigration is a big point because capital needs free movement of labour in order to commodify labour, but it also needs to fuel racism in order to keep the working classes divided. And so there's a contradiction, and the government doesn't know which way to go. So it's having a Brexit, <laughs> commonly known as something not totally unlike a stroke, a brain hemorrhage, or an epileptic. Yeah. <laughs> a complete seizure. A complete seizure of any understanding as to why David Cameron created this situation that he desperately needs not to happen. He desperately, he desperately needs it not to be arrested. But he started it off on getting better control, limiting the borders for immigration. <laughs> 
and then he didn't get what he wanted, thank God. So then he stuck with the Brexit. But he knows perfectly well that that doesn't solve that problem for him. Because that's being in Europe isn't the cause of that problem. The problem for him is that he doesn't believe in, in the freedom of movement. That's his problem. His problem is he doesn't believe in the freedom of movement, but he needs, he needs labour. And he has to have freedom of movement in some way to get it. So all of these, all of these contradictions are happening. And to my mind, as I get older, but certainly not any wiser, to my mind something I've learned in my life is at the heart of the most simplest thing is an unbelievable complexity. And at the heart of the most complex thing is an unbelievable simplest thing. <laughs> and such is the paradox of life. So I'm, I'm not saying that we have to sit all day and read books and read history so that we know everything before we're able to defend ourselves and our friends and our fellow citizens and our neighbours and people in other countries. We don't. But I am saying that to be very effective in what we're doing, we must not only learn from our own experience, but learn from the experiences of people who have trod this path before us all over the world. And that experience is in a history that is not written in mainstream history. It's written in a history that is carried forward by people in struggle. And sometimes to hear it and know it, you have to get into the struggle and listen to older people and listen to other people and begin to find the commonality. So that a hundred years after the rising of 1916, the sheer audacity of it, Hmm. That's what, that's, I think that's what inspired people. The sheer audacity of it. That such a small group of men and women imbued with a vision for their <coughs> society stood against the might of the British Army and paid for it with their lives. It was like, it's the audacity of that action and the width of that dream that is yet to be fulfilled. Yet to be fulfilled in Ireland, and yet to be filled, filled anywhere else. But, nobody's gonna do it. <laughs>